Introducing the Jeffrey Epstein I Knew, a new podcast from CNN, hosted by Vicki Ward. The seven-episode series takes you behind the scenes to hear a one-of-a-kind account of Epstein, an individual who's more myth than man. Vicki Ward has been reporting on Jeffrey Epstein for almost two decades and takes listeners beyond the headlines to explore who Jeffrey Epstein really was, where he got his money, and the circumstances surrounding his death. Subscribe to the podcast, The Jeffrey Epstein I Knew, wherever you get your podcast. If you haven't listened to Unladylike yet, you should check it out. Unladylike is a podcast about gender rules and the people who break them. You know, those unwritten but totally bullshit expectations of how we should live our lives. Every episode is like a how-to guide steeped in history, research, and real women's stories. Unladylike has covered everything from where to buy vibrators to diet culture and selling weed to the Equal Rights Amendment. Find these episodes and many more by searching for Unladylike Now wherever you get your podcast. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and I've always been a fan of the Browns and always been a fan of the captain. I don't know what that means, but you do the math. Here's the captain. I think it means it's good to be seen and it's good to see you. FYI, Epstein didn't kill himself. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week, we are very happy to be drinking Texas Red. This is an American Texas Amber Lager. Texas Red is a very balanced beer with notes of caramel, plenty of malt character, and just the right amount of hops. Garage grade, three and a half bottle caps out of five. This week, our fridge is full. Thank you to all of our good garage friends. We'd like to give a cheers to David in Dunloring, Virginia. And a big shout out to Mary in Morgantown, West Virginia. Next up, we have our friend Dustin in Heartland, Wisconsin. Old Cheesehead. And a big We Like Your Jib to Julie in Indianapolis, Indiana. Next up, a big shout out to Camilla in Costa Rica. And last but not least, of course, we have Wednesday up in beautiful Vancouver, British Columbia. Everybody that we just mentioned went to our website, truecrimegarage.com. And they donated to this week's beer fund. And for that, we thank all of you. And that's enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. December 23rd, 1991, in Blue Collar, Corsicana, Texas. This is just about 45 miles south of Dallas. Diane Barbie was watching The Price is Right. It was about 10.15 a.m. when her 11-year-old daughter, Buffy, ran in from outside and said, Mom, the neighbor's house is on fire. Diane ran out onto West 11th Street and saw that the house, just two houses down from hers, was in flames. The man who lived there, Todd Willingham, was standing shirtless and barefoot on the porch, his upper body covered in soot, and his hair burned. He was screaming, my babies are burning up. He yelled at Diane to call 911. Diane's phone was shut off, so she had to run down the block to a neighbor's home to make the call at 10.24 a.m. 
Todd grabbed a stick, smashed it through the front window of the burning house, only to have the flames shoot out. He tried another window, with the same result. This was witnessed by Buffy Barbie. Todd ran into the yard and kneeled in the grass. According to another neighbor, he cried out, My babies, periodically while falling silent at other times. One photo from the scene that day shows Todd sitting on the bumper of a fire truck, his head bowed down over his knees. His body language shows despondency. When Diane returned to the scene, Todd was standing by a chain link fence. Diane could feel the heat from the burning house, and soon five windows not previously smashed by Todd blew outward. Then, she said Todd ran to his Cadillac, parked by the house, and pushed it down the driveway, away from the flames. Firemen arrived, and Todd shouted at them that his children were inside, in their bedroom, in the front of the house, where the flames were shooting from. A fireman radioed for more backup and said, Step on it. The home we are talking about is a one-story wood structure, a small home. Firemen started to spray water on the front porch and into the windows of the burning house. One firefighter, equipped with an air tank and mask, was able to enter through the front door and proceeded down the hallway to the kitchen. A refrigerator blocked the back door of the house, and the kitchen was empty of people. Meanwhile, out front, Todd was becoming more and more hysterical. A police chaplain was trying to calm Todd, who started telling him what had happened when a firefighter emerged from the house with a two-year-old in his arms. He sank to his knees, and the little girl's arm flopped, lifeless. The firefighter gave the little girl Amber CPR. Meanwhile, Todd rushed toward the still-burning house. He had to be restrained by police chaplain Father Monahan to prevent him from entering the burning home. Restrained to the point that Father Monahan and three other Corsicana police officers had to wrestle with Todd and handcuff him. Father Monahan got a black eye in the process. Another firefighter, Barvin Smith, told investigators that when he arrived at the scene, he too had to restrain Todd from going into the home. He told police that Todd was yelling that his babies were in the house and was acting real hysterical. He restrained Todd from going onto the porch, he said. Based on what I saw, on how the fire was burning, it would have been crazy for anyone to try and go into the house. Todd was taken to the hospital. He had burns on his shoulder, face, neck, hands, and his hair was singed. He was kept overnight. Amber, meanwhile, was pronounced DOA at the hospital. And one-year-old twins Carmen and Cameron were declared dead at the scene by a justice of the peace. The children's mother, Stacy, was tracked down and informed of the tragic deaths of her children and the loss of her home as she shopped for Christmas gifts at the Salvation Army. This is True Crime Garage, and this is the case of Cameron Todd Willingham. After he was released from an overnight at the hospital, Todd was brought in for questioning. He spoke with fire investigators Douglas Fogg, Manuel Vasquez, and police officer Jimmy Hensley. Todd's story was this. Stacy, his wife, left that morning to pay the water and electric bills. Now, the family was behind on several accounts, this including their mortgage. And when Stacy went to the Salvation Army to buy presents, for the kids after paying these bills. The family had very little money. They didn't even own a stove. 
They just made do with a hot plate, a microwave, and a deep fryer. Around 9 a.m., Todd says that he heard the twins crying in their bedroom. So he went in, he got them out of the crib, gave them each a bottle, put them on the floor. Two-year-old Amber stayed asleep in her bed in the same room. Todd put a baby gate up as there was no door to the kid's room. Todd went back to bed and fell asleep. Later, he says, he was awakened by Amber's cries of, Daddy, Daddy, she's screaming. The house, when he wakes up, is filled with smoke, and he could barely see. Since he slept in the nude, he said he felt around for his pants and put them on while yelling at Amber, telling her to get out of the house. The house had no phone, so he could not call for help. By this point, he's crouching low, and he's feeling his way around so he can make his way down the hallway back to the kids' room. The hallway was filled with black smoke, and the air reeked of burning materials. He could hear popping noises that he thought were wires and electrical sockets blowing. When he got to the kids' room, he had to stand up. Remember, he placed the baby gate in the doorway. He stood up to climb over the baby gate, and at this point, his hair caught on fire. He put out the flames with his hands, and then he got down on the ground, and he started crawling around on the floor inside this room. This room is now engulfed in flames. At this time, he's feeling around for the girls, but unfortunately, all he found was a doll. He couldn't feel Amber in her bed either. At this point, Todd later related that the fire was all around, including the top of the walls and on the ceiling, but not on the floor. This is why he was able to crawl and then walk despite being barefoot. The heat became unbearable, and burning debris started to fall on him. So he staggered out the front door. This is right nearby where he is at this point. This is when Diane Barbie arrived to find him on the porch. He told investigators that he tried to get back inside more than once, including when he broke the windows with a stick, but the house was engulfed in flames and the heat was overwhelming. Investigators asked Todd if he had any idea how the fire started. He says he wasn't sure, but that it seems that it started in the kids' room since that's where the flames seemed to be coming from when he was staggering down the hallway. He said that he and Stacy had three space heaters inside the home and that one was in the kids' room. Todd said Amber got some whoopings in the past for playing with the space heater. This might make sense, too, that the fire started with something electrical since he says he heard snapping and popping noises. One fire investigator, though, testified that he found this space heater in the girls' room in the off position. Todd said he could not think of anyone who would want to hurt his family. He said he and Stacy had their problems, but neither of them could live without their children. Well, and most of these space heaters have some kind of safety mechanism if they tip over that they shut off. But because of the time period, you wonder if they even had a feature like that. He said of Amber, his two-year-old daughter, who cried out, Daddy, Daddy, to tell you the honest-to-God truth, he says, I I wish she hadn't woke me up. The Willingham's 50-year-old home was severely damaged by this fire. Photographs show the charred, burned-out remains of the walls and the floors in the front of the house. Yeah, I'll post pictures of the house and any of the reports that we talk about and all the characters involved And all the people involved in this case, I'll post pictures of that on Instagram at True Crime Garage. The melted artificial tree and singed teddy bear still soaked from the fire hoses is visible in pictures of the scene, as are the blackened kids' beds, uh, bed and baby crib. The back part of the house where the master bedroom and kitchen are suffered mostly smoke and water damage. The couple found themselves not only in shock and grief over the loss of their toddlers, but bereft of their home at Christmas time with no possessions, clothing, or even money for funerals. 
But rather than pity and compassion from the community for grieving parents in the wake of a tragic accident, instead, the tide began to turn. And the tide was turning against Todd Willingham. Now, we said in the trailer, Cameron Todd Willingham, but anybody that knows this case knows that this man goes by simply Todd. So we will, for the sake of making it easier on ourselves, he's just Todd moving forward. As is typical with fires, arson investigators sought to determine the cause of the fire. Todd, of course, gave permission for authorities to go through the charred home. He said, quote, I know we might not ever know all the answers, but I'd like to know why my babies were taken from me, end quote. The assistant fire chief, Douglas Fogg, he was a Vietnam vet with four Purple Hearts. He had been a firefighter for 20 years, and he was a certified arson inspector. Fogg's co-investigator for this case was State Deputy Fire Marshal Manuel Vasquez. He's considered one of Texas's leading arson investigators. Vasquez had a background in Army intelligence and had investigated more than 1,200 fires in his career. Fogg and Vasquez went over the Willingham's 975-square-foot house systematically and painstakingly. They said they went in with no preconceived notions of what happened. Vasquez said, quote, The fire tells a story. I am just the interpreter. After examining the perimeter of the home, the inspectors observed that they could open the back door and squeeze into the kitchen behind a refrigerator that was in front of this door. The appliance had been in that spot, supposedly, for some time. The kitchen had smoke and heat damage, but it was not burned. The fire started elsewhere. The men followed the hallway from the kitchen past a laundry room and then the master bedroom to the front of the house, where a living room was on the left and the kids' bedroom was on the right. The hallway ended at the front door leading out to the front porch. Now, they noticed that the laundry room had what they considered to be weird posters on the wall, a poster of what looked like the Grim Reaper and then other dark themed pictures of skulls. Amber was found under the covers in the bed in the master bedroom. This room too was determined not to be where the fire started, but it was a different story in the girl's bedroom where the twins bodies were found on the floor. Fogg and Vasquez thought back to Todd, telling them that he had crawled around in the girl's room and only found a doll, but two of his children had been right there. As they continued to move through the home, following the evidence, they began to formulate some opinions based on observations. Here are the things that figured most heavily into their report. The bases of the walls in the hallway and front rooms were charred, indicating that the fire burned low down, which ordinarily fires burn upward. Irregular char patterns on the floor were shaped like puddles, similar to what would form when flammable liquids poured onto the floor burn in puddle-like formations. The fire burned through the flooring, carpet, and tile and burned so hot under the kids' beds that the mattress coils were ash white. They noted that the fire appeared to have burned low to the ground, and again, normally fires burn up high. Glass pieces from the broken windows displayed a spider web pattern referred to as crazed glass. Fire textbooks at the time attributed this pattern formation to a fire burning extremely fast and hot, as would occur with a liquid accelerant and then the glass splinters as a result. A flashover took place in the front bedroom. This, again, is the kid's bedroom. The investigators perceived what they believed to be a burn trail from the room shared by the girls into the hallway and to the front door. At the front door, they found that the threshold was burned. On the front porch, brown stains permeated the concrete floor as what might happen with the use of an accelerant. 
V patterns on the walls are traditionally considered indicative of extreme smoke and heat radiating upward from a burning object. The fire inspectors looked for V patterns to decide what was burning hottest and quickest to determine the point of origin. Fogg and Vasquez detected three of these V patterns in the home. Mm -hmm. One in the kid's bedroom, one in the hallway, and one at the front door. These three distinctive origin points showed that the fire, according to this report, was set. So what it seems like they're observing is that somebody put an accelerant down on the floor in three different spots. Correct. And that the fire was burning very hot from the bottom up, meaning the floor up. And I think because Todd is visibly no burns on his feet that they start thinking that this is evidence that he possibly started the fire himself. Yeah. So to put it in simplest form, I think first of all, his story, his account of his movements through the house before he exited the home don't seem to match up with what the post fire evidence is showing these in inspectors. Right. And then on top of that, I mean, really at, at the most, the, the most logical thing here is if you have more than one point of origin for a fire, somebody set that fire, right? You know, an accidental fire is going to start in one location and then burn throughout. I'm sure somebody will send me a nice email that tells me that I'm wrong, that there was a situation at one point in the history of our world mm -hmm. that a fire was an accident and it started in three different points. I would argue that, and I'm sure investigators would argue that would be an extremely, extremely, extremely rare occurrence. If you can find three points of origin, you've likely found an arson. And as you pointed out too, if there was an accelerant used, it makes sense that it would be poured on the floor, causing the fire to burn from the, the floor up rather than wherever it actually started. If it were an accident, catching the walls up high, the ceiling, and then burning in that manner. Right. Correct. Now, I just want to be very clear. So you're stating for the record uh, on this episode that you are not a fire expert. I'm not a fire expert. My only knowledge of fire inspections comes from this case and a few other cases that we've already discussed. Okay. Are, but are you still the crispy colonel? I am. Okay. The fire investigators sent samples of the burned out home to the lab. Uh, the lab determined that one of the samples did contain evidence of mineral spirits, something that is found in charcoal lighter fluid. Yeah. This sample that tested positive for accelerant came from the threshold of the front door. This is interesting, too, because we talked about that poor trail or the fire trail that the inspectors noted in their report. The report pointed to 20 indicators of arson and concluded that the fire with multiple visible points of origin was intentionally set. Again, what they're stating is that somebody would pour accelerant in these areas, which all led to the front door, which would lead to that threshold where they found the lighter fluid. Correct. Directly from the report, they are stating that someone poured an accelerant in the girl's room under their beds on the floor into the hallway and then out the front door. And then that person exited ahead of the flames, the burning hallway and doorway prevented anyone else from escaping out the front door or anyone coming in to help. And keep in mind in the kitchen, they surmise that the refrigerator had been deliberately moved to block this back door. Right. One of the two exit points. So the back exit point, you can't get out because of the refrigerator, the front exit point, you can't get out of because of the flames. If this was set up in this manner, then it's, I mean, somebody intended for the children to die in this fire. Right. No survivors. Now that someone, the investigator said, was Cameron Todd Willingham. And this was a triple homicide.
If there is something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals, BetterHelp Online Counseling can help. BetterHelp offers licensed professional counselors who specialize in issues such as depression, anxiety, relationships, trauma, anger, family conflicts, LGBT matters, grief, self-esteem, and more. Connect with a professional counselor in a safe and private online environment and get help at your own time and at your own pace. Anything that you share is completely confidential. It's so convenient you can schedule secure video or phone sessions as well as chat and text with your therapist. Best of all, it's a truly affordable option. Our listeners even get 10% off your first month with discount code GARAGE. So why not get started today? Go to betterhelp.com slash garage, then simply fill out a questionnaire to help them assess your needs and get matched with a counselor you'll love. That's betterhelp.com slash garage. That's betterhelp.com slash garage. This holiday season, maybe it's time to gift the ones you love or yourself something a little cozier. Lucky for you, Brooklinen is delivering comfort all season long. Home of Internet's favorite sheets, Brooklinen's got over 50,000 five-star reviews and counting. I love my Brooklinen sheets. You're going to love them too. Not only do I love the comfort, but I love the style. They got so many wonderful styles to choose from, and you're going to love their website. Brooklinen offers luxury sheets, robes, loungewear, and more without the luxury markups. They even moved beyond the bedroom to offer essentials for your bathroom like towels, shower curtains, and bath mats. Like softness, comfort, essentials to help you relax, Brooklinen has it all. I couldn't recommend their products more for graduates, newlyweds, friends, or family, or treating yourself to a bedroom upgrade you deserve. Get 10% off and free shipping anytime when you shop at brooklinen.com and use promo code GARAGE. Brooklinen is so confident in their product that all of their sheets, comforters, and towels come with a lifetime warranty. To get 10% off and free shipping, go to brooklinen.com. That's B-R-O-O-K-L-I-N-E-N.com and use promo code GARAGE. Brooklinen, everything you need to live your most comfortable life. The holidays are approaching and you may be thinking about how you're going to save some extra money. Well, consolidate your high interest credit card balances to a lower rate and save with Lightstream. Get a rate as low as 5.95% APR with AutoPay. That's much lower than the national average interest rate of over 20% APR. Plus, your rate is fixed, so as rates continue to rise, your low rate won't budge. There are no fees, and you can even get your money as soon as the day you apply. Just for our listeners, apply now to get a special interest rate discount. The only way to get this discount is to go to lightstream.com slash TCG. That's L-I-G-H-T-S-T-R-E-A-M dot com slash TCG. Subject to credit approval, Rate includes a 0.50% auto pay discount. Terms and conditions apply and offers are subject to change without notice. Visit lightstream.com slash TCG for more information. That's lightstream.com slash TCG. All right. Cheers, mates. Thanks for joining us. Cheers to you, Captain. Cheers to you, Crispy Colonel. (laughs) The arson triple homicide ruling wasn't the only thing that was working against Todd Willingham. Despite initial witness reports that Todd had been hysterical and distraught, crying out for his children, yelling to Diane, and to have somebody call 911, having to be restrained by firefighters and Father Monaghan more than once, some of the witnesses began tempering their statements and others came out with statements against Todd. Diane Barbie told police that she had never seen Todd try to enter the house. She told PBS frontline that Todd was a very mean man. And she commented to police that Todd seemed more concerned about moving his car than with his kids being inside the burning home. Right. Todd told police that he moved his car from the burning house so it wouldn't explode, causing further damage. Another neighbor said Todd did not appear to be 
excited or even concerned about the fact that his kids were trapped and that he made no effort to go into the flames. At times, Todd was described as calm and defeated, squatting in the yard or sitting on the fire truck bumper or sitting on the curb. And Father Monahan, too, he dialed back his early statements that Todd seemed hysterical. Did he dial back his black eye? (laughs) Well, he began to imply that as he thought about things more after this event, that he says Todd seemed to be completely in control and perhaps he was putting on an act. Mm. People started to whisper that Todd wasn't injured or at least wasn't as injured as he should be. Let's get into who is Cameron Todd Willingham. Let's take a look at this. And But when we discuss his character, one thing I want everybody to try to keep in mind, it might get a little difficult, it's important to remember that just because Todd was not likable, and in my humble garage opinion, a bad person, that does not mean that he is guilty of murder. Right. Just because you're a boner face doesn't mean you're a murderer. Cameron Todd Willingham was born in Ardmore, Oklahoma on January 6, 1968. His mother had several children with different men. She left when he was an infant, and he ended up being raised by his father, Gene, and his stepmother, Eugenia. Gene was an ex-Marine who ran a very strict household. Todd didn't always abide by the rules, but he was very close with his stepmother. Todd was a good-looking kid with black hair and a big, strong frame, but he didn't do well in school, and he got in trouble, and he dropped out of school, this in the 10th grade. After dropping out of school, he turns to petty crime and generally just being a hoodlum. Mm. He was arrested a number of times, this for things like driving drunk, public intoxication, carrying a concealed weapon, stealing bicycles, shoplifting, attempted auto theft, and burglary. The old bike jacking. Todd, however, was a charmer. His probation officer, Polly Gooden, said that he was one of her favorite kids, and one juvenile judge who sentenced him to probation said, quote, he just did stupid crap like steel bikes, right. end quote. It was just an old shit turd, end quote. Well, Todd met Stacy Kai Kendall mm-hmm. in Corsicana, Texas, when he was just 20 and she was a senior in high school. Of course, Acana was a used to be oil town of 24,000 residents. And really, this area has fallen on hard times at the time of our story. Stacy was from a troubled home. When she was just four years old, her mother was strangled to death by her stepfather. Jeez. Stacy and Todd. They hit it off and got serious fast. He moved to Corsicana from Oklahoma to be with her. Stacy got pregnant and gave birth to Amber, and then again later giving birth to the twins. Right. Todd Willingham was only 23 when he found himself saddled with a girlfriend and three kids under the age of three years old. And he had one killer mullet. Yeah, that's right. He he had a mullet that won awards in different states. Well, he and Stacy, Stacy was a a little bit younger than him, uh, got married a few months before the fire. By all accounts, including Todd's own admissions years later, he treated her very badly. Not only did Todd cheat on Stacy, but he drank way too much and he would leave for periods of time. Again, though, I mean, this might prove that you're a bad person or a douche canoe or whatever, but that doesn't mean you're a murderer. Well, he loved to play darts. Uh, He was known to flirt with a lot of women and, again, often drinking a lot. Well, again, to be fair, I told you about the mullet, so chances are they were flirting with him. Well, I tell you what. Actually, Captain, I think that you see this a lot when boys in their early 20s just aren't ready to be men yet they they've signed up willingly for grown men responsibilities but due to immaturity they ultimately end up pooping in their big boy pants and not being a real man at all real stinky pants 
Yeah. Well, Todd and Stacy's relationship was volatile to say the least. Right. When the fire occurred, Todd was laid off from work and acting as a stay at home dad while Stacy worked at her brother's bar to support the family. On top of all of this, Todd was physically abusive to Stacy. The police were called to their place more than once. They, there were even rumors he tried to induce a miscarriage when she was pregnant with the twins by kicking her in the stomach. Oh, One neighbor, this guy just gets better and better. Well, that that's a rumor, but we know the physical abuse was in fact a truth. Right, but. If he didn't stop the physical abuse while she was pregnant, then that seems like the rumor sounds true. Even if he wasn't kicking her in the stomach, if he's abusing her while she's pregnant, that can cause a miscarriage. One neighbor called the police saying that they could hear Todd hitting Stacy and yelling at Stacy, saying, get up, bitch, and I'll hit you again. But Stacy said that Todd would never hurt their kids, much less deliberately kill them. She said that he lived for his girls and he spoiled them rotten. Let's point out that the girls' autopsies showed no evidence of any physical abuse. Right. But this was inconsequential in the minds of many. As Corsicana resident Vicki Prater put it to Frontline about the community turning against Todd, she said, quote, Todd Willingham had not treated his family in a respected manner, so he didn't get the benefit of the doubt that some people would have. Prosecutors weren't sure what Todd's motive would be to murder his children. There were life insurance policies on the children, but they were purchased by Stacy's grandfather, who he was the beneficiary of of a grand total of $15,000. Right. But I think the, one of the things that you have to look at when you're looking in, at motive here is we have a very poor family living in a poor area in a poor house right before Christmas depression, is, you know, is higher up during these times. Suicide rates are higher up during these times. They're paying bills that they're late on, they're shopping at the Goodwill store to for Christmas. They have three mouths to feed. He has no job. You could argue that by setting the fire and ending their lives that this is his way out. You know, he he's like you said, he signed up to put his big boy pants on and all he's been doing is shitting in them. So now it's going, well, let me take these big boy pants off and this is how I can do it. Yeah, basically, I mean we have a situation here where Todd's not going to benefit financially from the deaths of these children, except of course that he would no longer have any financial obligations right. for these three children as well. The district attorney, Pat bachelor attributed the alleged murders to quote, the children interfering with his beer drinking and dart throwing end quote. After Todd was released from the hospital, he had burns on his hands, face, and neck, one shoulder, and singed hair and eyebrows. He and a friend arrived at the burned-out home in a truck blasting loud music, this to pick through the wreckage for salvageable items. Todd was observed to lament the loss of his beloved dartboard, and some neighbors said they could hear laughter. And after a few days after the fire, people in the community held a dark competition fundraiser, this to gather funds for the girls' funerals. Todd and Stacy attended this, and as Vicki Prater, the fundraiser organizer, put it, Todd had too much fun for people's liking. He asked the bar owner to put aside a new set of darts for him. Prater didn't want to have him spend the community's donations on these darts, so she took money out of her pocket, giving it to him for the dart set. Right. Now, personally, I I understand why they're trying to raise the money and all that stuff, but personally, if it was me, I, I couldn't even attend something like that. It would be very difficult, but, we, but what we have is a situation here where there might be rumors and speculation amongst the community. There's been no charges brought forth right. or forward yet. Now, the rumors, as stated... 
started to swirl that Todd was heard saying that money will start to roll in because people pitied him. This, of course, did not sit well with any of the locals. Police investigators on the case began to make note of circumstantial evidence against Todd. In police interviews, Todd came across more as a patting himself on the back type for what he tried to do to save his children. The lead investigator, Jimmy Hensley, said to Frontline, quote, Todd didn't show any remorse through the interview until I actually showed him the pictures of his children. At that time, he started crying. You know, I don't think he was sad so much that he killed the kids as much as that it's coming to light that, you know, he's a suspect in it. This is awful tragedy, but we don't know how somebody is going to react. First of all, we have rumors and reason to believe that this guy's character, Todd's character, is is like you said before, is of that of a shit stain. So he's just going back to that original character. Again, that does not mean that he is um, responsible. But once you kind of, you know, place his character with the evidence that this fire was started by somebody, this is what leads to his arrest. Right. Fire started by somebody who... Todd admittedly says was in the home before the fire started. Right. So he is arrested and this was by a SWAT team on January 8th, 1992. He was held on $1 million bond while a grand jury was convened to consider an indictment against him. An indictment for capital murder came down on February 13th, 1992. Todd couldn't afford a defense attorney, so a team was appointed to him. This consisted of David Martin, a former state trooper, and Robert Dunn, a local defense attorney who handled all types of cases. Todd was adamant that he had not set the fire and that he did not kill his children. He was also adamant about his innocence that when the prosecutor offered Todd a chance to plead guilty to avoid the death penalty, Todd refused to accept this deal. His father and stepmother even visited him and begged him to take this deal. But Todd would not budge, saying, quote, I ain't going to plead to something I didn't do, especially killing my own kids, end quote. Well, and at this point, his own lawyers see the evidence and say, hey, look, there is a lot of evidence against you, or at least pointing in your direction. And I believe they advised him to to take the deal as well. 100%. And very likely they probably shared that evidence with his parents asking them, Hey, we can't talk sense into this guy. Right. You go talk to him at the very least as his representative, because that's one thing we've talked about in other cases. Like when the guy that had to, (laughs) that had the horrible responsibility of defending John Wayne Gacy in court. Yeah. He said, you know, 30 years later, he's, he says, Basically, what you have to do, what your responsibility is when you go into a situation like this and you believe your client to be guilty and John Wayne Gacy of such horrible crimes, Todd Willingham of the deaths of his three children, horrible crimes, at the very least, to provide your client with some form of service, your job is to at least make it so that the state does not execute your client. Well, in this case reminds me a lot of like the Chris Watts case. The family went missing. They couldn't find the family. So all of a sudden you have the husband acting suspicious, right? But nobody really wants to to blame the husband. And in this case, there's this awful fire. These kids die in the fire, you know, right before Christmas. The, the husband's acting a little strange and you don't want to blame him. Now we're to the point where he's arrested and, and everybody's looking at the evidence and looking at his character and going, Hey, take this deal, you know, and, and, and at least you you won't be executed. Yeah. The, the trial state versus Willingham commenced on August 18th, 1992. And it lasted just three days. Surprisingly. The prosecuting attorney was Assistant D.A. John Jackson. The Honorable Buck Douglas presided. 
In Jackson's opening statement, he told the jury that Todd Willingham poured a combustible liquid on the floor of the kids' room and then poured more of that same liquid in the hallway and out the front door. He then stood by and did nothing as the heat, flames, and smoke killed his three children. In his own opening statement, Todd's attorney, David Martin, rebutted that statement, saying, quote, The state's theory in the case is the most unexpected, unprobable, unreasonable scenario that we can imagine, end quote. He argued that the state's case was entirely circumstantial. Now, in a surprise move, the state called its first witness. This was convicted felon, his name, Johnny Webb, age 22. It just sounds like a convicted felon. Old Johnny Webb. Well, he was a career criminal and a crack addict who was in the Navarro County Jail at the same time as Todd. This is in January and February of 92. Webb was in on robbery and forgery charges. He suffered from psychiatric disorders and was on various medications. When asked on direct examination whether he had, quote, any trouble with mental impairment or anything like that, he responded, not always. Webb testified that he (laughs) met Todd while in jail, and one day, while the two were standing on either side of a glass partition that had a slot for, you know, like the meal tray, so that can come through, they would stand there and where the slot is, they could actually talk to each other, communicate through that spot because of the slot. Todd broke down. He says Todd broke down on this one day crying. And during this time that he's crying, he confesses to Johnny that he in fact did kill his kids. The story Todd told Johnny Webb, according to Webb's testimony was this. Todd came home and found one of the girls severely injured, perhaps even dead because of something that Stacy did to the child. Todd decided that the way to get out of this situation would be to set a house fire. He took some lighter fluid and squirted it all around on the walls and the floors in a pentagram pattern and then lit it. But first he lit some newspaper and burned one of the kids on their arms and forehead this to make it look like they had been playing with fire and that that set the fire. He says, then he ran out of the house and refused to re-enter the home. Now, according to Webb, this whole spontaneous confession thing went down in an area that was in full view of guards and other prisoners and right underneath microphones connected to the intercom system that was monitored by prison staff. And Webb had only met Todd less than a month before. Todd denied involvement in the fire to anyone and everyone, including Webb, yet all of a sudden he decided to unburden himself to this stranger. Yeah, I never trust these jailhouse snitches. Well, it in this situation anyway, it defies belief to me. I agree, but often in these cases when somebody from prison snitches on somebody else and they use them in a trial, the prosecution was able to like gift them something. So basically pay them for their confession. Yeah, that I mean it's a it's a favor for a favor, essentially. The problem on top of that in this specific incident is that this confession should have been heard by somebody else or recorded on top of him just telling this other uh, jailmate. Right. Before Webb left the stand, Jackson, the prosecutor, asked him, Johnny, have I ever promised you anything in return for your testimony in this case? To which Johnny answers, no, sir, you have not. Now let's make sure that we remember Johnny Webb's testimony. The next state's witness was Diane Barbie, the neighbor who called 911. Right. She testified that she ran down the street, saw the burning house and Todd on the porch and that he was screaming. Then she stated that he started screaming whenever we came outside. She said the house was not in flames, but that smoke was coming from down low. 
She admitted that when she ran to find a neighbor to call 911, she was gone maybe six minutes. She said Todd was hysterical, hollering and all, but he managed to tell her that Amber had woke him up and then jumped off the bed and he couldn't find her in the black smoke. She said that while Todd ran back and forth between the house and the yard a few times, she couldn't get him to go back in to save the girls. Another neighbor, this is Mr. Long, arrived, and just then the house blew up. The heat was so intense, Diane could feel it from where she stood in the Daniels' yard. This is the yard between hers and the Willinghams. Right. She could hear electricity popping, she said. She said she could not tell whether Todd was injured, but he had black soot all over his arms and back, and his hair and eyelashes were burned. Todd pushed his car back from the house about eight feet down the driveway and then sat down across the street on the curb. The fire trucks arrived at 1026. The next morning, Diane testified a small group gathered at the burned house, including Todd. A boombox was blasting music from someone's truck, but they turned it off when they saw her. That night, Todd and Stacy came by, and Stacy was crying, and they were discussing that a neighbor was taking up a co- collection, and Todd and Stacy had bought some clothes for Amber, this presumably to bury her in. Todd said to Stacy in front of Diane that he tried to go back into the burning house. Diane's daughters both testified that they did not see Todd try to go into the burning home, that he did not appear injured, and that he appeared more concerned about his car. John Bailey, the neighbor across the street, testified that the day after the fire, he saw Todd and Stacy going through the debris. He said, quote, it was not the attitude of people that just lost their children should have had. But that's a case in so many cases is people go, well, they're just acting different than I would. And so therefore that means they're guilty in those people's eyes. It's, it's kind of strange that people do that constantly. He goes on to say that it was more of a laughing cut up type of attitude. Jerry Long, another neighbor stated that during the fire, Todd didn't seem quote real excited. He would holler about his kids and then stop and look himself over as if to see whether he was injured. Long denied that Todd had cried at all. But on cross-examination by David Martin, he admitted that in an earlier statement to police, he had attested that Todd had been crying. He also said that sparks and popping sounds were coming from the utility pole where the wires met the house and that Todd commented to him that they had some trouble with the electricity. One of the first responding firefighters testified that when he arrived, Todd approached him and told him that his babies were in the house. He could see that the front rooms of the house were ablaze, including the floors and the porch. He entered the home through the front door and noted that the back door was blocked by a refrigerator. The twins were on the floor in the front bedroom, burned beyond any possibility of survival. On the stand, this firefighter referred to the Willingham home as the crime scene, and Martin moved for a mistrial, but the judge denied his motion. He also denied Martin's motion to exclude the inflammatory photos of the two charred infants' corpses introduced into evidence by the prosecution. The firefighter, whose last name is Franks, continued to testify. He said that at the scene on the day of the fire, Todd did not exhibit any symptoms of smoke inhalation. Franks also said that when he was at the scene after the fire to collect evidence, Todd was also there and was looking through the house for his dart set and was quite upset about not being able to find it. Right. Ethel Baptist, a nurse who was on duty at the hospital, testified that Todd did a lot of crying and saying that he should have died with his girls. It should have been him instead of them. She saw only small burns on Todd on his hands and back, and his hair and eyebrows and lashes were singed. On cross, 
Martin asked her if she knew that Todd had soot in his nasal cavities and throat. She said she was not aware of this, but when pressed, admitted that one would get soot in these areas after breathing in smoke. After carefully setting up the narrative that Todd Willingham was self-centered, calculated, violent psychopath who wanted his kids out of the way so he could pursue various recreational activities, prosecutor John Jackson called Douglas Fogg, the fire investigator, to the stand. Fogg testified that investigators could not find any accidental causes of the fire, including gas leaks and no electrical shorts. He said the space heater was off. Note, they checked this days after the fire, so technically anyone could have turned it to the off position. Correct. The glass windows were examples of crazed glass, which can be caused by fire burning an accelerant. The fire seemed to burn low to the floor rather than high up. There was a puddling effect on the floor in the hallway and in the kids' room, indicating a liquid was poured. The floor was burning underneath the metal threshold plate at the front door, this indicating the presence of an accelerant. The wood under the aluminum threshold and a melted charcoal lighter fluid container tested positive for, quote, mineral spirits of kerosene. This accelerant, the the kind that would be found in charcoal lighter fluid. Wood fires don't burn hotter than 800 degrees, and the degree of damage to the aluminum threshold piece shows that this fire burned hotter, requiring an accelerant. And the burn V patterns and puddling show that the fire was started in three different locations. Accidental fires don't start in three different locations. Fogg's testimony was backed up by Manuel Vasquez, the state arson investigator. He bragged on the stand that he investigated 1,200 to 1,500 fires and, quote, most all of them had turned out to be arson and that he never knew of a time when he was wrong. He said he knew the fire was arson from his investigation of the scene, but also because Todd had told him a story of pure fabrication. If Todd had really looked for his children in the burning home, his feet would have been burned and he did not appear to have any signs of smoke inhalation when Vasquez spoke with him days after the fire. Over objections from the defense attorneys, Vasquez was permitted to answer a question from the prosecutor. Based on your investigation and our examination of the scene and your conclusions, can you tell what the arsonist intended to do by setting this fire? His response, yes, his intent was to kill the little girls. The state presented the two pathologists who performed the autopsies. They testified that the girls died of carbon monoxide poisoning from smoke inhalation. They also said that because of the charred nature of the kids' bodies, it would be difficult to determine whether there were any surface injuries to the kids that predated the fire but that they did not observe any internal injuries or broken bones. An ER doctor testified that Todd had first-degree burns on his face and neck, a small second-degree burn on his right shoulder, and a blister burn on his middle finger on his left hand. He also had soot present in his nose and in the back of his throat with a slight cough, but his carbon monoxide level was only 3%. This consistent with being a smoker, which Todd was. And with all this damning evidence against Todd, this is where the prosecution will rest. This show has been brought to you by BetterHelp. Whatever struggles you are facing from depression and anxiety to trauma and grief, BetterHelp can connect you with a professional counselor in a safe and private online environment. It's so convenient. You can schedule secure video or phone sessions, as well as chat and text with your therapist. And anything that you share is completely confidential. Best of all, it's a truly affordable option. Our listeners even get 10% off your first month with discount code GARAGE. 
So why not get started? Simply go to betterhelp.com slash garage and fill out a questionnaire to get matched with the counselor you'll love today. That's betterhelp.com slash garage. Introducing the Jeffrey Epstein I Knew, a new podcast from CNN hosted by Vicki Ward. This seven-episode series takes you behind the scenes to hear a one-of-a-kind account of Epstein, an individual who's more myth than man. Vicki Ward has been reporting on Jeffrey Epstein for almost two decades and takes listeners beyond the headlines to explore who Jeffrey Epstein really was, where he got his money, and the circumstances surrounding his death. Subscribe to the podcast, The Jeffrey Epstein I Knew, wherever you get your podcast. Want to remind everybody to check out our other show. It's a great show. It's, sometimes it's funny. Sometimes it's mystery. Sometimes it's more true crime. You never know what you're going to get. This week, for the people that listen to Off the Record on Stitcher Premium, they got to hear me and the captain talk about what we call the serial killers of comedy. Check out Stitcher Premium Off the Record. Yeah, the lopper. <laughs> you get to hear about the lopper. Thanks for joining us in the garage, and be kind to everybody. That's right. You better be kind. Also, be good and don't litter.